Well, thanks everybody for coming today. I would like to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Katherine Duckworth. Um, Dr. Duckworth is an assistant professor with the Psychosocial Oncology and Cancer Patient Support Program, housed within the Department of Internal Medicine, Section in Hematology and Oncology here at Wake Forest. Um, clinically, Dr. Duckworth works largely with stem cell transplant recipients and um, performs pre-transplant psychosocial assessments. She obtained her bachelor's in science from Vanderbilt University and her PhD in counseling and counselor education from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, she did her postdoctoral fellowship in psychosocial oncology at the Wake Forest School of Medicine. And her um, areas of research are numerous, but include um, cultural influences on confronting mortality and health transitions through chronic illness and end of life. So on behalf of the Department of Internal Medicine, please join me in welcoming Dr. Duckworth. everyone for coming out on this very cold January morning. I appreciate you being here. Um, and what we're going to be talking about today is psychosocial considerations in the context of life-limiting illness. And we're going to be taking a look at both research and clinical considerations. Okay, so I'm going to start this morning. I've selected two pieces um, that are artistic pieces that one of my colleagues when I first came to Wake shared with me, both of which are quite provocative um, and have some very simple and yet profound statements um, contained within. So the first one is by Franz Wright, um, entitled On Earth, and it says, Resurrection of the little apple tree outside my window leaf, light of late, late April, called her eyes, forget, forget. But how, how does one go about dying? Who on earth is going to teach me? The world is filled with people who have never died. And that's a little bit of a somber and kind of macabre tone to start off with this morning, but I really want to underscore that last piece, that phrase that says, the world is filled with people who have never died, because that's really where I'm going to encourage us to start thinking um, about this morning. So this idea of confronting mortality, exploring our finitude as individuals, these existential tenets, that's really what we're going to be honing in on this morning. Um, so thinking about when we do receive a diagnosis of life-limiting illness, how do we go about confronting our own mortality? And I'm going to juxtapose this a little bit with something which I feel like is equally, if not more important, which is how do we go about living, right? This piece is um, slightly dated, but one of my favorites. It's from Hollis Sigler's Breast Cancer Journal from 1992. And I think it captures beautifully this notion of how do we go about living with a diagnosis of life-limiting illness? So how do we go about the daily tasks of enjoying a meal with our loved ones when we have this um, all-encompassing sense of uncertainty and notion that we are, in fact, facing limited time. So I want us to really think about the synergy of confronting mortality, of dying, of thinking about living, but also that, that space of, of living with the notion of impending death. So on that um, slightly up, uplifting note, I'm going to take us to my objectives this morning, which include to broaden awareness of psychosocial considerations in the context of life-limiting illness, we're going to be talking, of course, a lot about a lot of individuals and what our patients here locally are telling us, but we're also going to be looking at systems and context and these broader trends in which we're confronting mortality. Um, I hope to have you guys reflect upon dynamic ways of confronting mortality and their potential impact on our patients' well-being. Um, we're going to be reviewing some local research data that um, myself and my team members have been capturing over the past couple years that we use to inform our psychosocial interventions here. And ultimately, I hope to increase your familiarity with our local clinical resources that can enhance the well-being of your patients. So we're going to start by reviewing um, a term just so we have a shared lexicon and um, shared language and we all are on the same page about what I'm talking about when I'm talking about quality of life. Um, I'm going to be using David Sella's terminology and understanding of quality of life, which is patients' appraisal of and satisfaction with their current level of functioning compared to what they perceive to be possible or ideal. And I want to unpack that a little bit because I think there's a lot going on in that um, definition. So first of all, quality of life, um, as we conceptualize it, is a construct that inherently is in flux. It's always moving. It's dynamic. Um, it's also multidimensional. And really important here is that it's based on patients' perspective, right? That means that um, as clinicians, it's not originating from us. It's really coming from our patients and what they're telling us about their own quality of life and how they make sense of it. Um, it's a dual-sided construct, 
So oftentimes we think about the downward declines in functioning, but those of us in mental health oftentimes think about positive psychology as well. So we're looking at the positive and wellness aspects of quality of life and um, some of these perspective shifts that oftentimes change as well when we get a diagnosis of life-limiting illness. A factor analysis typically shows us that it has four components, including physical, functional, social, and emotional aspects. And so when we're thinking about researching this and inter intervening clinically, uh, we want to make sure that we're tending to all those different dimensions. Um, so that's really where our focus is going to be today during this lecture is quality of life of those with life-limiting illness. And we're going to be looking at individuals and systems, OK? Um, I'm a visual person. I like a good model. This one's also a little bit dated, but Wilson and Cleary's conceptual model of patient outcomes is one of my favorites. Um, we have everything over here on the left, starting at the cellular level, biological and phys physiological variables, all the way over to the right, which is um, overall quality of life. And these concepts moving left to right get increasingly difficult to measure because they're, they're broad and increasingly difficult to define. Um, I also like this model because it's really pulling in characteristics of the individual and also characteristics of the environment that ultimately impact quality of life. And so when we get to the part where I'm, I'm sharing some of the research data that we have, oftentimes we typically just look longitudinally at quality of life over time to see how that changes. But sometimes we try to create research studies and or clinical interventions where we're looking strictly at one of the tributaries that ultimately impacts one of these levels. And so I think it's really helpful to have a visual to make sense of how we can intervene in lots of different ways to ultimately impact quality of life over here. OK, so things that um, we are all aware of here, but I really want us to, to start thinking about what it truly means for our patients to come and see us and to make sense of this notion that they do have a new diagnosis of life-limiting illness. So they are immersed in uncertainty. Um, they oftentimes experience a range of emotions and assorted logistical changes within their life, which ultimately create ripples, right? So this means changes in family systems, impacting children and caregivers, um, changes in life roles and community obligations. Um, we talked about that positive psychology aspect of things, but we oftentimes see positive growth, right? I don't want to discount that piece of things that we try to look at. Um, and then what we're talking about a lot today is this existential questioning that they inevitably encounter. So when they are thrown into this zone, even if it's not in an acute capacity, they are confronting their mortality on some level. So we really want to look at these broader existential tenets as well. And that's really where my clinical and research interest lies, um, exploring the way that we as individuals approach our own finitude. Um, I, I pull a lot of my work from Arias, which ultimately says that this basic tenet is there's a relationship between men and women's attitude towards their death and their awareness of self or their awareness of existence, right? So the way that we think about our own mortality, the way that we confront our own mortality ultimately impacts the way that we're living and our quality of life. And so that's why I'm going to really encourage us to think today about the context in which we do that and also the individual variables that impact um, that process. So my question for you guys is, what is our role in improving congruence between actual and hopeful paths at the end, both individually and contextually? So context matters. We're going to start with context, and then we'll move into the individual variables. Um, clearly, cultural and situational contributors impact this process greatly for all people. But we're going to look at some broader trends in which we all have um, come to confront our own mortality. So, I am quite interested in um, historical research and archival research, and I think we can pull a lot from that arena because this idea that Eric Seaman talks about of encountering otherness, including similarities and dissimilarities, and notions of living and dying well is a very interesting one because it encourages us to reflect upon our own context in which we confront mortality. So I'm going to ask you guys to think about this broad question of how would other people in different historical periods or in different situations um, make sense of our present day context of confronting mortality. What prompts change in these contexts, internal and external catalysts? And how do these individual and collective notions ultimately impact our angst related to our own finitude? OK. So again, a little bit of a macabre turn here. here but um, we're going to rely on this term that Seaman uses called Death ways. I like this term because it's broad and all-encompassing. Um, and I pulled a quote directly from his introductory chapter in one of his books um, that says, today we have, with a few exceptions, lost this curiosity about outsiders' ways of dying or death ways. But for thousands of years, when people encountered an unfamiliar society, they wanted to learn about the stranger's death ways. 
People recognized that an excellent technique for understanding a society's ways of living was to observe its ways of dying. Through death ways, they discern clues about how unfamiliar peoples conceptualized the afterlife and the supernatural, how they honored elites, what they consider to be proper relations between parents and children, and many other crucial beliefs and practices. So I'm going to pose a simple question is, what do people think about our current death ways? Um, this notion of thinking about the art of dying well is one that has been ever present across um, human history. Uh, Ars Moriendi, the first two Latin texts that appeared in Western literature in the um, early to mid 15th century post-black death really exemplify at least Christian beliefs of the late Middle Ages of basically a guide as to how to die well. But you see humans really trying to make sense of what does it mean to confront my own mortality within and across time. And if you think about um, the, the drastic change that's occurred over the last even few hundred years, I'm going to give us a few examples here to think about how these contextual examples really have impacted the way that we confront death and ultimately, and more importantly, how we live prior to dying. I'm very interested in um, Southeastern indigenous history, and so this is an example. I tried to pull examples from the Southeast, but this is an example of the Carolina Algonquian death waves. And so we have a picture here um, in the village of Secatan along the Pamlico River in the late 16th century, and it's a painting by John White, who was a settler. Um, what we see here, I picked this example strategically because what we see here is a sense of community in terms of engaging the dying process, right? So we have um, a feast of solemn prayer, and we have the ceremonial dance, of course, and then we have a burial temple, which is over here exemplified, demonstrating the corpses of some of the leaders, the tribal leaders, um, and a, a little bit, again, detailed here, but we have their dried flesh behind the tombs, and then we have a statue that was very important to them. So what we see here exemplified in this painting of an outsider looking, looking in into a community ritual is a sense of community, a sense of awareness as to what one's place and role would be within that society, um, and uh, an overall interest in this, this different way of engaging death. I'm going to move forward a little bit here um, about uh, 200 years forward. And again, these are pulled from the Library of Congress, very vivid images, I understand. But I picked this one as a specific catalyst um, demonstrating how change occurs within the way that we approach death. So this is from the Civil War. We have um, an example of fratricide here, of course. But we have, for the first time, humans dying far away from home. Right? When we die far away from home and there's so much uncertainty in that process and we're not next to our, our close kin and our networks and our loved ones, we have to make sense of what does it mean to honor one's life and to preserve one's body. Right? So this is when we still we are starting to confront this notion of how do we prepare burial, how do we um, engage funeral practices. And this was a, a defining, arguably, Drew, Book, Drew Gilpin Faust argues, a defining um, catalyst to really make sense of how we as humans have really started to prepare the body in present day for grieving rituals. So you see an embalming surgeon over here on the right. So we're going to fast forward a little bit earlier. This is close to my home. I walk up in Old Salem a lot, and this is in the Moravian settlement. So what we see here, um, and I think this exemplifies it quite well, is we see a woman whose children all died within a nine-year time span, right? So we see an M. Hester. I don't know much about her, but I'm really struck by the fact that she's buried with three of her children um, in, in such quick succession, right? And so I think this, this picture really exemplifies the fact that in the 19th and the earliest 20th century, there was just this persistent familiarity with death, um, whether or not we're talking about epidemics, but we have this this tendency to postpone baptism or not name children, as we see up here in this other grave over here where it's just labeled infant. Um, but I picked this slide because I think that it exemplifies another really important aspect of this, which is propinquity and familiarity with death, right? It was, it was ever present in the home, and it was something in which the familial um, practices were, were constantly tending to and nurturing. So from community rituals to different catalysts that ultimately impact the way that we engage this process, to um, familiarity and nearness. We've seen lots of changes over time, which takes us to present day. If you guys stick with me, I promise this is all going to come together. So present day, um, I pulled this work also from RAS, but we have this broader trend, which he refers to as the hidden death in the hospital, which I think is really interesting for us to consider. So when we're thinking about our patients confronting mortality and receiving a diagnosis of life-limiting illness, what does that mean for them present day in the context of these other broader trends that we've noticed? 
So in the 30s and the 50s, um, the 1900s here, we saw this, this trend towards moving to the hospital in tandem with advancing science, right? Um, with this necessarily come changes in all those examples I tried to just give you. Changes in community, um, changes in sense of place and nearness and famili familiarity with the dying process, um, perhaps a reduced sense of solidarity as well. Um, we have lots of data now. I use an example from Tino comparing 2000, 2005, and 2009, in which we saw a, a decrease in deaths in acute care hospitals, and yet we continue to see increases in ICU usage at the end of life, and also an increase in transitions in the last 30 days of life. So what does that mean? And thinking about all those historical examples I tried to just run through quickly, what does that mean about confronting mortality present day for our patients? Um, with increasing interventional capabilities, of course, across all these examples, regardless of our cultural or spiritual beliefs, we continue to strive for congruence with what our patients want, increased comfort, reduced fear, and, and dignified exits within supportive communities. Okay, so I'm encouraging you guys to think broadly about the context in which this is happening, the macro processes, um, in tandem with the medical capabilities that we have today. But I also want us to think about the micro, so the individual experiences and what our patients are telling us about how they're confronting this process. And that's um, where we're going to move into next, is I am going to review some results from the descriptive studies that our team um, has, has gathered over the past couple of years to really shed light on what our patients are telling us here locally. Um, I picked four because I think they highlight different ways that we go about doing this interventional research and different ways that we ultimately use that research data to um, impact and guide our clinical care of patients. And so these four studies are ones that we've, we've completed over the past couple years. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we look at longitudinal depression scores, patient provider communication understanding, quality of life and caregivers, and then also healthcare decision makers, and how we've, we've really pooled those to guide our clinical care. Um, so thinking back to that model I showed you guys at the very beginning of that, that broad notion of looking at quality of life over time, this is very similar. Um, this is with a stem cell transplant popu population, and we, we basically have tracked longitudinal depression scores over time within this patient population. Um, this is a little bit misleading because we started off with 198 patients on the, the first time point, which is the pre-transplant, and of course with attrition and mortality, um, we have lost folks over time, but the 198 is at the pre-transplant -ti time point, and then you'll see um, the subsequent five time points, you'll see how those percentages of patients endorsing clinic clinically significant depressive um, reports change, right? And so one thing to really notice here is looking, of course, at the individual silos and the percentages of patients. Um, we'll see a huge spike here, I would say about 37% endorsed clinically significant depression scores at the discharge time point from transplant, but we can also look at trajectories. And so this is a really nice example, I think, of us making sense of, well, I guess I'll, I'll step back a little bit. The first point is um, a, a clear percentage um, of patients along each of these time points is endorsing clinically significant depression scores. Um, with that said, we look at the trajectories. So we have limited clinical resources, where do we intervene? And so we would look at these data and say, okay, the discharge time point is a really clear area where patients are expressing more suffering and where we would need to guide um, our clinical resources and make sure that we're doing adequate assessment and clinical intervention there. So that's one way that we take a look at the data that we're gathering to guide clinical care. Um, back to that visual again. So that was an example of looking at, you know, CESD scores and quality of life over time. Sometimes we just look at those tributaries that ultimately impact things upstream. And so this was an example of a patient provider concordance study that we actually submitted for publication yesterday. Um, well, we looked at the intent and the nature of treatment from patients and from providers, and we looked at their concordance scores. And so we had patients give us reports about their perceived intent and nature of treatment, and then their respective um, providers, so looking at the dyadic data to look at associations between the two and also variables that might be associated with discordance. So within this particular study, we had 100 patients who participated. Um, all of our patients had completed at least one cycle of treatment or were um, scheduled for surgical treatment or had undergone treatment for at least a month. Um, and then what was really interesting about this is we actually had medical providers return the data, um, so we were really surprised about that. We, we had not only providers engage the study and return the data, but 65 of them returned the data on the same day, which is really hard to do. Um, so we have patients and providers pretty much returning data about their perceptions of care on the same day. Um, 84 of the 100 returned it within a one-week time period. So we have data that's 
more or less on top of one another. So we can really see at that same point in time, are they on the same page? Um, so this is a graph demonstrating the intent. So did patients and providers understand the, int the intent of their care? Um, we found that only 61% of the time, patients and providers were on the same page about the intent of their treatment, which is pretty profound when you think about it. We gave them these four categories, and you would think they would be in a similar ballpark, but 61% of the time, um, there was concordance. Another way to think about some of these data, 36% of the time, patients were more optimistic than their doctors, right? So um, almost every single one was more optimistic when there were those incidents of discordance or disagreement. 73% um, of patients reported that their treatment was intended to cure their cancer completely, whereas only 50% of their healthcare providers reported that. So really interesting thing to think about. Okay, so are we even on the same page in terms of agreement? And finally, we looked at associations. The only variable that we, that we found that was associated with concordance was spirituality. So patients who um, felt like their treatment was curative scored higher on the spirituality subscale, which is interesting to unpack as well. We also look at side effects and understanding of side effects. Um, patients and providers agreed 69% of the time regarding their acknowledgement and understanding of treatment side effects. Um, and 23% of the time, patients indicated that they did not even understand the associated side effects with their treatment. Um, patients who reported understanding of the side effects endorsed significantly lower distress scores, which was a key finding for us, right? And again, this is not causal data, but it's really interesting to take away that, that nugget of understanding, that those who um, reported understanding of the side effects were less distressed, right? So two potential ways to intervene in terms of level of comprehension, but also distress levels. Um, Okay, so some take-homes from this particular study, a substantial minority of patients misunderstood the goals and nature of their treatment, poor understanding of probable side effects was associated with greater distress in our patient population, and our findings ultimately suggest the need for repeated patient educational efforts prior to and during treatment, distress screening and intervention, and provider education initiatives. Okay. I want to take us away from the patient population and move to another population that is very dear to my heart, which is caregivers, um, often overlooked and quite distressed. So in this particular study, um, we paired up with a surgical oncology team, and we looked at the patient population who had had hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, and we looked at their, their respective caregivers, looking at quality of life and CESD over time. Um, what is really interesting to note about this study is if you'll look up here at the graph, this is looking at depression scores over time, and we have four time points, pre, post-surgical visit, six months, and 12 months. And so what you'll notice here is that the caregivers are in orange, and you'll see that they're consistently above the patients, which is a really unique finding, right? So our patients are telling us that they are endorsing higher depressive symptom burdens consistently at every time point. Okay, so we can look at their respective percentages. We can also look at their individual trajectories, which change. So the change in those trajectories is also clinically significant. They each have their own respective trajectories over time. So when we're thinking about intervening clinically, what we see here, too, is that caregivers start much higher at the pre-time point, but we also see a spike in the patients, which are the blue, um, at the post-surgical visit. So when we're thinking about using data to inform mental health clinical interventions, this type of data is so important for us because we not only can say, okay, caregivers are, are struggling, um, but we can look at the respective percentages and say, we clearly need to devote services at all these different time points, but we also might have differential timing as to our interventions. Um, so just looking at, at T1, for example, the pre-surgical pre, um, visit time point, we see that the caregivers on average scored 4.8 points higher than their patients. Um, and that we also have different trajectories after that. Both are, again, spiking at the 12-month time point. So another example of how we use this data to really guide psychosocial interventions. Um, I used, right here, I used the pre-time um, point, so time one, just to really break down the possible, probable, and cases of depression. Again, you'll see caregivers higher at every single time point. Um, so percentage for caregivers at time one that had um, the respective possible, probable, and cases of depression are 14, 11, and 14 versus 7, 7, and 2 for patients. And so what we concluded from this is significant numbers of caregivers endorsed high depressive symptom burdens. Um, caregivers and patients have different trajectories, reflecting the need for different, differential timing of intervention. Um, and evaluation of quality of life and interventional um, aims must move beyond just the patients. The caregivers 
cannot be left behind. So related to caregivers, albeit slightly different, we've also looked um, over the past couple of years at surrogate decision makers, so proxies. Um, we've become really interested in the level of proxy engagement in healthcare. Um, so in this particular study, also with stem cell transplants we look, patients, we looked at um, 162 surrogate decision makers um, of both patients who are prepping for stem cell transplant, but also those who are in active treatment for leukemia likely moving towards transplant. Um, so arguably going through some, some pretty intense treatment, and we expected to see a high level of involvement of surrogate decision makers. Um, we administered lots of different uh, questionnaires, including an attitude survey, an anxiety inventory, and also just some basic questionnaires looking at their level of engagement. And this graph is very simple. It demonstrates the self-reported level of engagement and care. And what was interesting about this is um, their respective patient counterparts are undergoing intense treatment, and yet we still see that 22% indicated minimal engagement in their respective patient's care. 26% um, moderate and 53% endorsed high. So quite the, the span and the spread, and we're trying to unpack um, what those factors are that really determines which groups they're falling in. Um, so we looked at some associated variables. We found that less educated proxies had less favorable attitudes about adv advanced directives and advanced care planning. Um, similar to the caregivers, we found that the proxies had um, state and trait anxiety levels that were significantly higher than their patient counterparts. Um, so, again, that notion of we, we can't ignore the caregivers, we cannot ignore the proxies and the surrogate decision makers and their involvement in patient care. Um, so one conclusion from this study is in spite of moderately favorable attitudes towards advanced care planning, reported health care engagement varies widely with a high percentage endorsing minimal engagement in care. A few other things, we looked at um, patient proxy data in other ways as well. Um, this is that paired t-test I was telling you about that demonstrates that proxies consistently endorsed both state and trait anxiety mean scores that were significantly higher than their patient counterparts. That's a visual representation of that. Um, so what is interesting here is this is looking at distress screening, which happens in all of our oncology clinics. Um, between groups, significant differences were recorded. These are our proxies. These are our patients. Um, there were relatively few patients or, or proxies who crossed the, the level of um, the threshold of significance over administration. So those who tended to score low stayed low. Those who tended to score high stayed high. Um, and within dyads, every time point, our proxies were higher than our patients undergoing treatment for leukemia and being prepped for stem cell transplant. Okay, so I'm going to try to tie together those four studies that I. I just went over very quickly um, to make sense of how we as mental health providers try to gain the useful nuggets and ultimately use them for interventional um, purposes. So our take-homes from these four studies that we consistently see play out through most of our research here with our local patients include a substantial percentage of our patient population endorses clinically significant distress. You know, one example of this was, you know, a little over 40 percent of our transplant population. Um, they also endorse depression, so 24% of our pre-transplant population. These data ultimately underscore the need for psychosocial care. So that means there's a, there's a substantial minority of our patient population telling us that they're, they're struggling, they're distressed, or they're depressed. Um, caregivers and proxies often indicate comparatively higher distress levels and depression levels than their patient counterparts. So those loved ones who are companioning their respective um, patients along this process are struggling as well and cannot be ignored. Um, patients and caregivers often have different trajectories of quality of life impairment, so we can't assume that they're going to be um, together in tandem within their trajectories. This changes over time, and it, it differs between the, the patient and, and caregiver groups. Um, we've also found that distress is, a is associated with a level of comprehension related to care. So again, not causal, but it's interesting to think about from an interventional standpoint if we're intervening from a comprehension standpoint or a distress standpoint, but both potential avenues um, through which we can intervene. Um, and relationships and repetition are key relative to increasing patient awareness of the intent and nature of their treatment, of them understanding their unique context, and connecting patients with the needed services. And that's what I'm going to talk about um, for this last portion of my presentation, which is um, the psychosocial arm of what we do. Okay. 
Before I do that, um, I've highlighted just some of the studies that we're doing. We're also involved in these studies. I really just want to broaden awareness about some of the really good work that's happening in the psychosocial realm right now um, within our institution with our patient population. Dr. Moskop is doing um, a fantastic interventional drumming study to improve quality of life and the hospital experience of our transplant patients. Dr. Rodriguez is looking at cognitive functioning in, in patients um, pre and post transplant. And Dr. Salzman is really spearheading some interesting work with adolescents and young adults. And so I just want to um, broaden awareness that there's some great work happening in the institution to improve the quality of life of our patients. Okay, which is, is mostly what we try to do. Um, our very small team, we have four clinicians on the psychosocial oncology team, and most of what we do um, happens behind closed doors. You know, people don't see the, the work that we do, but we have the privilege of, of working very closely with patients and caregivers um, to, to ultimately try to improve quality of life. And this still feels a little bit ambiguous and confusing to a lot of people about what is it that you guys do behind closed doors. Um, and, and I really want to underscore the point that most people don't actually get to us. Most of the, the psychological work happens in your office um, with medical providers. And so I, I think it's so important that you guys have the awareness and the skill sets to listen carefully and respond thoughtfully and to um, just be mindful of the needs of your patient population and how, how those needs change over time. There are a lot of barriers to mental health care engagement. We are very mindful of the fact that it's, it's quite difficult to get folks to us, um, whether or not that stig this is stigma related. If you think about seeing a mental health provider, you probably have all kinds of interesting notions in your head about what that looks like. We're not that bad. Um, but still, people have stigma related to engaging our services and um, just logistical barriers. Unfortunately, we see this increasing tremendously, just difficulties getting here, paying for parking, um, finding someone to watch their children. And so we're very mindful of this, and we have built our program um, with these things in mind. So we realize that we are specialized in psychosocial oncology, and this is quite a difficult population to work with because oftentimes they don't feel well. There's a level of unpredictability, and they have a lot of logistical barriers to getting to us. And so we're very much integrated here in the clinic and also um, on the inpatient units, and we really try to work to go to patients. Um, we try to schedule appointments immediately prior to or following medical appointments, so we don't have to be yet another thing that they come to, um, another reason they have to come to the, the medical center. Um, we also try to make sure that we have great continuity of care. So we meet folks at the beginning, we introduce our services. If they're not interested in seeing us or don't feel like they have a need to see us at the beginning, we stick with them to a degree and try to keep checking in on them so that when they do need us or maybe their caregivers need us, that we're available and you have a familiar face. Um, so the other thing that we do, which I think is very, very unique and a great asset to the community, is that we never turn folks away from mental health care here within the oncology clinics, um, which, is a, which is just almost unheard of in most places. So we have a really interesting um, tiered system where if you can't afford to pay, we figure out how to see you regardless. Um, so we're very fortunate that we have a lot of philanthropy to help us do that. And so we're very accessible. We're very integrated. We try to schedule folks um, with their respective needs in mind. And so we continue to try to put the word out to get more people to see us because we think quality of life is very important. Um, so what do we do? Um, the psychosocial oncology services that you guys have here at this institution, mostly individual work, inpatient work, outpatient work. Um, we do assessments in the clinic for new patient referrals. Um, we do crisis response. Unfortunately, we have a lot of folks who are suffering a lot, and so all of us rotate and, and try to be um, available to assess folks with lethality assessments. Um, and ultimately, we work to try to improve psychological symptom burdens, which impacts the, the engagement and care that your patients have with you. Um, and it also, of course, impacts the quality of life. We have tried to really extend our group work. This past year, we started a breast cancer support group, an adolescent and young adult survivorship group, and a caregiver group. And we're extending our reach into survivorship clinics. So back to that, that definition I shared with you at the beginning about um, quality of life. We have wellness aspects and positive psychology aspects of quality of life. And so we're really trying to think about transitions and what this looks like post-diagnosis and post-treatment. Um, we do a lot of logistical support, and we also have lots of other services that our, our program offers or sponsors, and including um, a therapeutic musician, massage, tai chi, and we work in collaboration with all of these wonderful folks who are also um, working with overlapping aims and missions to improve the quality of life of our patients. So some final thoughts this morning for you. Um, these data really underscore the need to attend to psychosocial considerations within patients and loved ones. 
you have a team of individuals here who are trained, have subspecialty training, um, to really do this type of research and ultimately use this research. This is a thing that I think is important. Use this research to actually intervene and make patients' lives better. Um, patients always balance hope and reality while confronting mortality. Um, we are doing these within this, this broad trend that, that definitely are changing if you think past the last, what, three, four hundred years that I just shared those examples of, um, the context in which we confront mortality changes quite rapidly and drastically, and there are all kinds of catalysts that prompt those changes, um, but in today's day and age, we still want to try to strive for congruence between what is important for our patients. Um, we must attend to the ways that we facilitate and improve living and confronting dying, both individually and systemically. And I'll continue to ask you guys how you think you can contribute to those, contextually speaking, and also individually. Okay, so that's my talk for today. I want to thank the transplant team, leukemia team, surgical oncology team, and, and my psychosocial oncology team as well for helping us gather that data, and most importantly, the patients who devote their time to teaching us. And those are my references. Thank you, guys. So we'll open up the floor for questions. Yes, sir. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, two, what is AYA for support oh, group? Sorry. I'm adolescent and young adult. Thank you. And a question, one of the, if you believe the data, one of the leading causes of personal bankruptcy in the United States is healthcare related. Right. Is some of the depression and caregivers uh, take that into consideration? Yes. Absolutely. In fact, um, speaking to the AYA data, Dr. Salzman, that's one arm of his study is he's looking at um, financial toxicity and so the acute and also long-term effects of that. So a lot of these questionnaires um, encompass questions related to financial distress and associated role changes, being unable to work, that type of thing. Yeah, good question. Hey, yes, that was a really nice presentation. Um, I particularly like the opening quote that you showed. Um, the data that she had on uh, sort of um, aligning understanding of the goals of, you know, treatment are, are really important. Um, you know, that's often contextual, you know, it can change. And I'd say a couple of questions. Um, uh, was, was that data obtained sort of at a uniform point mm -hmm. in the course of treatment? Was that at, you know, after the first visit? Because I, you know, could imagine you know, that that improves over time if it was the first visit. Um, and also, I mean, is this something we should be routinely collecting from patients yeah. in order, you know, to align expectations? Great question. To try to avert, you know, some of the challenges that often occur late in the course of illness when, you know, patients are in intensive care units when perhaps that's not the most appropriate approach. Right, great questions. Um, so I'll start with the first one. I think I understand that. Um, that's probably one of the methodological shortcomings of that study in the sense that it was kind of a mixed bag of folks. All of them had, I would say, uniformly were at the beginning of their care, so with, within at least one month of starting treatment um, or schedule for certain procedures, but they were largely at the beginning, and we were mindful of the fact that this is a very dynamic construct and likely moves over time, so it's one measurement at one particular time. Um, that said, it was a feasibility study, so we were really excited that the providers actually engaged. I mean, that, that's huge for us. So people return their data in a timely fashion, so that was one of our main take-homes, is it's feasible to get that kind of data. Um, we do think that one of the next steps of that line of research, I was talking with Dr. Powell about this, is perhaps building in some mechanisms, even electronic perhaps, of some type of feedback loop such that the providers would be mindful of what the patients are sharing and that we can have additional opportunities to have more congruence and get on the same page with that. Um, but yeah, I would say that I guess you could look at that as a strength of the study, that it's quite heterogeneous, lots of folks at different points along their treatment trajectory, but it's also a dynamic um, construct and quite difficult to measure. But I think there are lots of opportunities for us to have that type of feedback system, whether or not it's just narrative feedback on paper and pencil questionnaires or some type of electronic communication channel to let providers know where things stand. So working part-time in the VA system, we always see these patients with post-traumatic stress disorders. And do you see that in patients who also go through treatment for cancer and in the long-term survivors patient group, what is the sort of the incidence or prevalence of this? 
Yeah, that's a great question, David. Um, I don't know, I can't quote you numbers in terms of incidents and prevalence. We do see it. I would say most of our, thinking diagnostically, most of our patients probably fall more in the adjustment disorder category, but we certainly see it, and oftentimes it's concomitant with other existing mental health issues, such as, you know, being a veteran or other things that they've encountered previously in life, and treatment ultimately exacerbates that. Um, but highly individualized treatment experiences, clearly, for every patient, some of which can be perceived as traumatic for some, so we do see that, and I, I don't think that's probably one of our strengths in, ter in terms of addressing trauma, um, but we, we really try to assess that thoroughly and try to, if we don't have the resources here, make sure that we get folks the help that they need for that. Yes, hey. Sorry, learning how to work the microphone. Uh, great talk, thank you so much. What really struck me was the one part where you said that that most of the psychosocial work that happens happens in our offices with us. Right. Uh, and that's actually a little intimidating for somebody who's more of a biochemistry nerd than a psychosocial nerd. Uh, so I'm wondering sort of what resources are out there for providers to sort of maybe assess their skills at this really important part of our, our job uh, and whether or not any of the studies you are planning have looked at provider's comfort level with this kind of an interaction with a patient when they're confronted with folks who have a life-limiting illness and how they feel about their skill sets. Thanks. Yeah, great, great question. Um, we here have not looked at that, but there certainly is a literature base on that um, because oftentimes that's not a particular strength of certain providers. Um, so continuing education and continuing involvement and willingness to look at oneself, I think is the, the important thing there. Um, we've tried to spearhead some things like groups here, especially for fellows and ways of increasing communication skills unfrequently, or I guess unfortunately they're not frequently attended because um, people are so busy and so that seems a little paradoxical, but I think that we have a role in bringing our skill set to that, um, formally or informally, and anyone who's willing to take a look at that, there's a huge literature base about um, different ways, different skill sets you can work to improve, but ultimately I think you can practice that within, within that dyad right there that you have with patients, right? Patients are very generous with their time and willing to give you immediate feedback, so figuring out how to have increasing insight and self-awareness about what's working well with communication, what are my patients telling me, and just doing that self-reflection I think is probably the most impactful thing we can do, but yes, we, we definitely need to um, continue to, I think, bolster our, our efforts to make those skills that we that we rely on frequently available to the providers here in the clinic as well. Katie, your, your talk was great. Just a couple of comments. So echoing what Tim is saying there, if, if the level of education of caregivers uh, and patients parallels, they're, just, they're lowering their distress. I think that intervention to help providers with right. our education arguably might have an observable <laughs> right. uh, improvement. The other thing is um, John Salzman is also looking at uh, resiliency mm -hmm. as a, like how do you measure resiliency right. and I think um, the transplant population, particularly the survivorship is a, an, as well as the AYA is an area where we could think about how to that. measure resiliency. Absolutely. This is fascinating. It opens up a lot more questions than it closes, which is wonderful. Uh, but I also was attuned to words. And I think a, a psychosocial nerd may be a, a, a you know, just, they don't match. <laughs> Maybe it's the other. But I'm also interested whether age mm -hmm. of the subject and of the caregiver, and also especially the gender of the caregiver and to, uh, whether these make any discernible difference. Thank you. In fact, one of the studies, um, I didn't present that data, but we looked, we broke it down by gender as well, and, and women tend to endorse, um, you know, higher anxiety levels for sure. So oftentimes you see gender discrepancies um, and sex discrepancies there. Um, so we certainly are mindful of that. It's a little bit trickier in terms of how we use that to actually guide clinical interventions, but certainly one of those demographic variables that we're mindful of how it, it impacts people's experiences. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to fill out your evaluations. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. Um, you got me. Thanks.
they're mainly collecting, you know, um, patient we have it routinely. Um, the feasibility showed that it actually worked quite well. Um, so Baird and I were talking recently about trying to implement something that would be more habitual in the clinic. So I think it's a really good idea to think about. It is. And the thing that I didn't share is that the other piece of that is that regardless of discordance, treatment satisfaction was high across the board. So it's so interesting because I started thinking, well, I wonder how that would ultimately relate to treatment satisfaction. Um, and patient reports.